Hello, everybody. That's it. So, as Lucy said, uh, so my name is Matty Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, which is a UK based global futures think tank. So, I look at ostensibly two kinds of futures. I look at the next 20 years, that's it, which is where the vast majority of multinational organizations typically spend a lot of their time. Uh, but then I also look up to 50 years out. So, I work with all G20 governments basically on the future of everything, whether it be healthcare, welfare, state, tax, education, jobs, and skills transportation, infrastructure, tra you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, while I'm a futurist, but I'm actually more of a strategic advisor. So I work with the vast majority of the world's most respected brands, including the brands that you're actually using right now. So companies like Microsoft, companies like Arm, Samsung, companies basically like Aon, Legal & General, City, UBS, Centrica, uh, and all these other organizations to help them on the one hand, basically see what possible and potential futures are actually coming down the line, but then actually help them reform their companies, build the appropriate workforce strategies. So for example, with organizations like PepsiCo, we have 300,000 people that are facing a very different future basically than the one that we've sort of seen historically. And when we actually have a look at the future, typically a lot of people are here. I talk about the future being over here. And with a lot of organizations and governments basically say, well, how do we get from here to here? So what I'm going to be doing through this presentation, and it's really quite a short presentation, bearing in mind that this is a huge topic in itself, is I'm going to be talking about the future of the workforce. Now, Lucy mentioned trends, but we're going to be sort of talking a little bit more sort of trends and technologies. But I want to show you basically the trends and technologies basically that perhaps you haven't actually thought of before or really noticed are actually already starting to emerge and uh, sort of impact basically, whether it's the UK workforce or the global workforce. So with no further ado, basically this is kind of the agenda that I've laid out for us today. A future backgrounder, business model innovation, because this inevitably drives basically who you hire, what you hire, how you go to market, so on and so forth. Automation paradox, that's it. So we all hear every single day basically about the impact that automation will have on the UK jobs market as well as the global workforce. And I'm going to actually put some new color basically into that. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about work from there. So we talk about work from anywhere, but this is actually work from there. So I'm going to show you basically how some of the professions that you think of as not being able to work anywhere else other than a central location, an office, for example, can actually work from anywhere to deliver services anywhere. Now, from a future background perspective, there are literally hundreds of emerging and exponential technologies. Now, these codexes contain all of them. Now, when we have a look at the future of products, when we have a look at the future of services, when we have a look at the future of work and all these other things that we care about, Inevitably, we have a problem to solve, and then we combine different technologies together to solve that problem. So, for example, next generation smartphone is a combination of technologies. You know, whether it's 5G, whether it's 6G, whether it's artificially intelligent chips at the edge of the network, and so on and so forth. So, by understanding what the technologies of the future look like, we can understand what the products and services of the future will look like. But there are also hundreds and hundreds of mega trends basically that are impacting us all. So today we live in one of the most complex times ever. You know, we're being impacted by a whole variety of new technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, AR, VR, genetic engineering, and so on and so forth, 3D printing, 5G. But we're also being impacted by all manner of societal, technological, environmental, and economic and political trends whether it is strategic dislocation, where we start separating from different countries, kind of a deglobalization trend, whether it's net zero, sustainability, cybersecurity, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the boards basically that I actually work with increasingly see the future as being this thing that is faster paced, more complex to understand, and then as a result, basically they find it much harder basically to develop the right strategies to try to ensure that their people and their organizations are as prosperous as they can be, let alone avoiding being disrupted. However, as we talk about disruption, every industry is being disrupted. When we have a look, for example, at farming, I could take every single UK farm, 
put it into a vertical farm, grow crops outside of London, and we can grow six times the crops in 350 times less space using no pesticides, no herbicides, no chemicals, and actually no water because we can suck the water right out of the air. When we have a look at the agricultural sector, we see a huge amount of automation because we see the combination of artificial intelligence, machine vision, and robotics that now mean that we can pick strawberries and raspberries right off the plant. When we have a look at the meat industry, I can take the cell from a cow, put it into a bioreactor, grow a hamburger. And you can do that in Cambridge if you want to with pork bellies and bacon. When we have a look at construction, over in Dubai, we are now putting plans in place to 3D print a 11-story skyscraper. When you 3D print a building, you can 3D print a four-story building or even a four-bed building 90% faster than you can build it using traditional tools and 80 to 90% cheaper. We're seeing 3D printed villages and towns springing up across the US and across Europe. When we have a look at energy, we're at the very start of a $92 trillion energy transition where we see a huge amount of creative destruction going on in the oil and gas industry, but we're moving from this industry to a renewable green industry. But that shift requires a major ecosystem shift, supply chain shift, thinking shift, investment shift, and a workforce shift. When we have a look at finance, we are moving basically from bank three to bank four. You can kind of think of the JP Morgans, the HSBCs, the Barclays, and the cities. But we're moving basically to a world dominated by fintechs, and we see a lot of those in the UK, basically like Revolut. But we're increasingly moving into this world of decentralized finance. And when you actually have a look at the world of decentralized finance, I can undermine fiat currencies like crazy. I can do peer-to-peer -peer trading, basically like Robinhood and so on and so forth. So the entire financial sector basically is being reshaped, shall we say undermined by new things. When we have a look at the healthcare sector, increasingly basically from a healthcare sector, I can use CRISPR genetic engineering, put you on an intravenous drip in guys in St. Tommy's Hospital. And if you had an inherited genetic disease, basically like Hunter's, Hunter's syndrome, I can clip out the bad gene, clip in a new gene, you no longer have that inherited condition. You are, no longer have inherited blindness. CRISPR, just as one technology, could help us cure 6,000 incurable diseases, and so on and so forth. Now, when we have a look at business model innovation, the reason why I bring this up is because business models drive hiring and strategy and so forth and so forth. So we know about the gig economy. About 35% of millennials actually operate and work in the gig economy. But increasingly, we have algorithmic organizations. So we have around 65% of the Fortune 500 actually use artificial intelligence to find talent, to hire talent, to manage talent, to put the right learning and development pathways in place for that talent. And then in some cases like Uber and Amazon who got taken to the European Court of Justice a little while ago, we have artificial intelligences that are monitoring your productivity in the warehouse or wherever it happens to be. And if you're not hitting the right KPIs and the right metrics, you're fired by artificial intelligence. So increasingly we have the rise of what we call algorithmic organizations. When we have a look at platforms like Twitter, there are about 20 of these companies in the UK, we're used to having public limited companies, limited companies, LLCs, and all these other sort of uh, company partnerships. However, we increasingly have decentralized, or decentralized organizations that have no head, no head office, their governance is stretched globally, they have no single point of control. Jack Dorsey recently launched Blue Sky, and the Blue Sky social network is a decentralized social network that essentially has no hierarchy. It has no head office or central location. Company as a protocol is already here. And then we have about another 20 of these, especially in the financial services sector, Wall Street and Hong Kong, as well as throughout Europe in the communications and social networking space. We have the rise of increasingly fully 
automated companies, where even the people who set them up say, if I die as the founder, these companies will keep running themselves. So these companies are typically based on things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotic process automation. We see Amazon becoming a fully auto autonomous organization. They've got a whole variety of patents in place for that. So when we talk about fully autonomous organizations, we talk about organizations that have no humans and no human involvement or even necessarily oversight. So when we have a look at the future of the workforce, how do you manage that as a policy? Now, when we talk about the automation paradox, I want to introduce you to my virtual digital human employee, Anna, which I will do in a minute. Now, when we have a look at automation, automation is actually not a straightforward topic. There are kind of three things that we should think about when we think about automation. We have jobs that can be automated like expense processes and sign-off and everything else. These are fairly dumb automations of processes, things like robotic process automation. We have autonomous artificial intelligences, like the ones that will drive our cars in the future and our trucks. And autonomous artificial intelligences are increasingly capable of taking in a lot of different data sets and then deciding based on that information what they should do next. Go around that corner, invest in that thing, whatever it happens to be. Now, in the Fortune 100, we're actually seeing more artificial intelligence decision-making systems being used by boards. And these boards kind of talk with these AIs to decide, do I invest in that market or that market or that market and so on and so forth. But when we have a look at auto autonomous systems, we also see autonomous systems coming through in the scientific community where, for example, we can now create vaccines within seven minutes. We can now simulate every single protein on Earth almost instantly, which has huge ramifications for the NHS and for medicine. So when we have a look at autonomous systems, which are typically deep learning systems, they are very, very different beasts to just basic automation stuff. And then we have augmented. Now, augmented, in my, in my sort of opinion, is by far the most interesting, and I'll show you why. Because when we start coupling humans, especially with technology, we can 100x, especially our productivity. Bear in mind, global productivity has remained stagnant at about 2%, depending on the market and the countries that we look at, for decades now. So when we augment the human workforce with technology, things become really interesting. But similarly, automation of the UK workforce and UK tasks is not necessarily as bad as we all think. There is a significant upside, and I'm going to show you on that in a moment. Today, we're all being disrupted. Here's Anna. And I'm not just talking about by digital humans, like myself with our conversational artificial intelligence, state-of-the-art high-def rendering, and neural networks for brains. So Anna is my digital human employee. Basically, she has a neural network brain and she is essentially a human, providing human-like experiences and conversations at internet scale for pretty much zero cents on the dollar. So Instagrammers, virtual bloggers, fashion models, they're all being disrupted by technologies like Anna. Now, when we talk about automation, if I automate a lawyer, and we're seeing that basically with companies like Dentons, Eversheds, and so on and so forth, that lawyer might lose their job. However, I can now have access basically to that skill because if I've automated a lawyer and I stick a behavioral interface over the top of that automation, I can now talk to that AI lawyer and say, create me a non-disclosure contract and include these kinds of clauses. So by automating particular skills within the UK workforce and by putting a behavioral interface over the top of it, I as an individual without the skills that that person had can now access those skills and almost that experience on demand. So by automating different jobs and tasks, this unlocks access to skills for everybody that everybody can tap into, which essentially unlocks the 
greatest amount of human potential and human capital in the history of the planet. Now, when we talk about artificial intelligence, which again is just this giant sector, on the one hand, basically, I can have expert skills on demand because I can talk to Microsoft's deep coder and I can say, build me an application that looks like this. And it will go off and build it for me and say, is this the application that you wanted? But I don't have any programming skills. So that's an automation dividend depending on which side of that fence you sit. But when we have a look at things like generative artificial intelligence, we also have AI to everything. So I can either use text or I can use my voice to say to artificial intelligences, create a new kind of music basically that only I will enjoy. Create a video of X, Y, and Z. Create an image of this. Do this. Write a book. And so on and so forth. Now, I'm a staunch believer, basically, in, the, in, the, in education. And when we have a look at the UK education system, I do not think it is fit for purpose. I'm fairly blunt with that. Basic education, yes. When we start going through secondary education, not so much. I'm going to show you why. So when we talk about unlocking human potential using increasingly sophisticated and autonomous artificial intelligences like those from Midjourney, OpenAI and ChatGPT, Microsoft, Google, and so on and so forth. Ordinarily, it would take my son, my son is 10, he, he's on Team GB for Pentathlon GB, so he's a GB athlete. If my son wanted to write a book on coaching for performance runners, it would have taken him about two to three months. However, using chat GPT, he and I wrote a book, literally a book, click the QR code or scan the QR code. You can have a look at it. Uh, Lucy's got copies as well. We wrote a book in 20 minutes. It took six hours to illustrate, two hours for me and Caden to proofread it, eight hours to format it. So to turn raw text and raw images basically into something that is a book format. But it, this is one of the most significant impacts on the UK workforce as well. So I automated all this, but it cost 20 pounds. Now to do all the illustrations for this book as an entrepreneur, it would probably have taken me about 2000 pounds. So that's 2000 pounds I didn't spend with UK illustrators or people on Fiverr or the gig economy. And this is the book. So my son used a suite of multi-billion dollar leading edge artificial intelligences to write a book and illustrate a book within one day that we are now selling for charity. That single suite of artificial intelligence technologies impacts over 1 billion jobs and over $10 trillion worth of GDP. Over 235 million people work in the creative industry alone, basically, and that disrupts all of them. These are the images basically that we actually created using the artificial intelligence just by doing text to image. We have AI coaching us as well. So for example, basically we've actually seen benefits of combining humans with artificial intelligence in the radiology sector to have a 36% benefit on both results and productivity. We have artificial intelligences teaching gamers, e-gamers, how to be better e-gamers. We have AIs in the US that are teaching customer service clerks basically to be better and more empathetic agents basically when they're managing customer service inquiries. We have artificial intelligences in the boardroom that are now helping executives make better informed decisions on what to do with their businesses and organizations. 
And then finally, when we talk about work from anywhere, I can put a construction worker in the middle of London, put them on a 5G network, and I can have them operate drone construction equipment in South Korea to build buildings. So powerful technologies help us decentralize the workforce in new ways. But I want to play you this video and then I'm done. So in this video, we use 5G networks across a Verizon network to do telerobotics on patients who are hundreds of miles away. So I can be a surgeon here, and yet I can operate on you if you're in Mumbai, Cape Town, or just up the road in London. We had a young woman with an acute heart attack. The total transfer time to get her to our hospital was three hours. There's a feeling of helplessness so as a physician that you know what the treatment is to limit their chance of death, but you can't get to them. Our hypothesis is that if we implement remote robotics in its full capacity, we will change the lives for hundreds of thousands of patients in the US and millions around the world. Using technologies like 5G networks and robotic systems to provide cardiac care at a distance and be able to do telestenting has the potential to change the landscape of medicine. 5G technology really opens up the possibility to do these over longer distances with minimal delays in signal and transmitting greater amounts of data. Being able to reach a patient hundreds of miles away to deliver the care they need when they need it is one of the most disruptive things happening in the medical industry. And so now we are pretty much at the end of our 20 minutes, especially so thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I think now we're over to Q&A.